Uh, this is what I get first. This is a script from Paul Jenkins. I usually get it emailed to me and then printed out and I punch holes in it put it in the binder and uh, just kind of start to think uh, in terms of first what all the settings are going to be, who all the characters are, anything that I have to do a little research on. Um, so in this case, it takes place in Las Vegas. I've never been there, so I have to look it up online just to see, get a feel for what the terrain is, what kind of buildings, those kind of things. Uh, but basically, it looks a lot like a movie script. I go through and uh, it says who's talking, gets a dialogue and a brief description of each and every panel. And sometimes I'll draw little thumbnails just to get an idea of the staging. And then once I have a pretty good idea of that, I'll come up with the general structure of the page. In this, in this case, it's pretty simple. It's just six panels, them talking. And I'll just do a real rough thumbnail, just like that. I actually did this while I was on the bus on, on the way to Boston. Uh, so then once I get this done, i get a little, little tighter in the composition and do uh, a 4 by 6 inch uh, layout. And this is what I actually send to my editor, Tom Grebort, and he says yay or nay. Fortunately, most of the time he says yay. And uh, from this stage, I next go to the computer and do a digital color study. Which <clears throat> looks like that. So basically, I just scan it in. Uh, I put on a layer for borders, put on a layer for text, and a layer for color. And the color. Uh, layer is set to multiply, which is a mode in Photoshop, and that just allows the drawing underneath to show through while you're putting on your color. Uh, I use levels a lot, hue, saturation, um, brightness to kind of like adjust things, and uh, usually it takes me about a day to do this plus this, sometimes less, but always done in a day. Uh, from that, I actually blow it up into the computer to actual size, and then I lightbox this onto the final illustration board, which is Strathmore Series 500 2 ply. For anyone who cares, which I do, um, but basically just trace it out. I like working small and then blowing it up bigger, uh, just so you can get a, I don't know, some of the energy from the original sketch and the final one. And then uh, it goes from that to that. Just kind of tighten things up. And it's at this stage that I really tend to think about lighting, uh, specifically as it falls on different forms, especially on the face. I get most of that done in the color study, but it's pretty general at this stage. So I'm just thinking in terms of his face is lighter than the background, as opposed to where the shadow falls on his nose. And this is where I start to think about things like that. Uh, what helps me get to that point are these little guys. I, <laughs> I make little little character sketches in three dimensions of not all the characters, but most of the characters who are going to be, you know, major characters or who will show up a lot. So anyone I have to draw multiple times and has to look the same throughout the entire story. So in this case, that means Johnny Blaze and his girlfriend, Roxanne Simpson. Uh, I make them out of Super Sculpey, which is uh, a nice little polymer that uh, stays completely pliable until you cook it in a conventional oven at uh, 250 degrees, 250. I'm not exactly sure, but actually I cook it most of the time with a heat gun. So I hold it in my hand and just do that until it's done. Uh, I also did one for Ghost Rider. And uh, his mouth opens too. <laughs> There's no need for that, but I really wanted to, so <clears throat> it, that's just the way it worked out. Uh, so anyway, once we're to that point, uh, put the final illustration board onto a Masonite panel. Uh, and tape it down and tape out all the borders. I do all the borders digitally, so that saves a lot of time. So I just make sure that the painting falls within those general parameters, and then I worry about the, the you know, rolling the borders later. 
uh, I keep this removable from my desk so that uh, I can clear it off if I need to like lay something out flat uh, or measure things. It helps helps for that. And then it's adjustable. And you can adjust the tilt on it like that. Um, once I get it all taped out, I uh, do a color study on real paper. If I can find it. There it is. I print out my finished pencils onto a 5x7 watercolor piece of paper. And uh, this is just to get a general feel for the actual paints that I'm going to use on the finished product. Uh, I don't always go uh, to this level of completion. Sometimes I do it pretty quickly. And it's just to get a real general sense of the kind of color range that I'm in and what my palette's going to be. Uh, but once I have that, then I start painting. I'll uh, give a brief description of the paints. Uh, this is what's called a stay wet palette, and it's basically a semi permeable uh, acrylic sheet that is suspended over top of a sponge that stays wet. And this allows the paint to uh, be usable for days and weeks at a time. And it really helps. I mean, once I learned how to use this, I dropped the oil paint because it was just taking, taking too much time. And it's just really great because you can you can mix all your colors, say, the night before, and then use them the next day, and it won't all go bad. Whereas in the case of oil, which generally takes longer to dry, it's it still dries overnight, so you can't always keep it fresh. Uh, but this stuff stays fresh almost indefinitely. Um, I like to use a bigger palette, but in this case I don't. I have one coming in the mail. It'll be good shortly. And I use a palette knife to kind of uh, mix everything up. Um, so I should say something about the structure of the palette, just in general. I basically keep a rainbow uh, going from yellow to blue. Everything in between. I don't use a lot of green because I generally don't get scripts that have green in them. Uh, I think it's only happened in the Hulk, and that was very brief. Um, so yeah, it goes yellow, red, blue, and everything in between. And then uh, I have my neutrals over here where I go black all the way to white. And then this is warm darks, and this goes to cool darks right there. And basically, that's how I always try and think about color, not in terms of specific colors, like, oh, that's red, that's blue. I just kind of shift things across the palette in terms of, oh, this needs to be warmer, this needs to be cooler, this needs to be less saturated, more saturated or lighter or darker. And those are the three basic uh, variables. And that's why color is so difficult, because there's three competing things, and sometimes one affects the other, even when you don't want it to. Because um, we start painting. In general, I like to try and get things done in one stroke, but it never seems to be the case. But the more water that you add, the better covering power it has in terms of getting every nook and cranny on the paper like that. But uh, in that case, you also get more of a washy feeling, uh, which may, may or may not be the color you're going for. So I try and kind of switch it up according to whatever I need. Because sometimes you want that kind of lost, washy feel, and other times you want to work more opaquely, uh, especially if you're going for a very specific color. Uh, and also when you're trying to match a color that's already on there, it's easier if the colors are opaque. <clears throat> so at this point, it's, uh, I won't say it's, it's mindless, but you're basically just trying to get the color where it's supposed to go and you generally know where it goes already uh, so there's not a whole lot of kind of rendering or anything just laying things down trying to get it done as quickly as possible and what really takes all the time is once you get into painting the figure or uh, maybe the backgrounds
Now, what happens if you mess up? Uh, it never happens. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's there's different kinds of messing up. There's messing up uh, in terms of it was a bad design, a bad com composition from the beginning. And in that case, you kind of just have to rethink things. Like in terms of, I don't know, you're in the middle, middle of the face and you realize the shadow just isn't working. In that case, you're going to have to go off into your color study and try and find a solution that does work before you go back to the finished piece. And then there are the mistakes where it just, oh, I dropped my brush. And in that case, you generally try and mix up a color that uh, either matches what it's supposed to be or you can go all the way back to white and just kind of start over. And that's probably the best thing about uh, acrylic wash as opposed to watercolor is that since it is opaque, you can cover up mistakes and it's uh, no big deal. I mean, you can tell in certain, certain instances, but in general, if you spend enough time, you can make it look like nothing ever happened. Here's what I'm just
Now, who are you basing these character uh, looks and designs after? Um, I basically go straight to the source. Uh, I mean, I'm doing this whole series is all about you know the origin story, so. I try and limit what I'm influenced by to just the very first issue that we're retelling. So I'm go to the original Ghost Rider, and I look at these drawings, uh, issues done by Mike Plug, and I just try and get a general sense for, you know, the particular features, and, and more, moreover, just the archetype that they were going for. Um, in this case, uh, Ghost Rider's pretty 70s, so, uh, you know, it was... The characters have that look to them and that was popular at the time just in the movies and just popular culture in general. And so I try and match that uh, in you know some small way, both with hairstyles and also with particular features that you know, they were going for. And that's why I do these, because since I have to paint the characters, I need a pretty good reference for lighting. Uh, that's, that's the main thing, because I could probably do you know, a line drawing and have it look generally okay, but as soon as I start painting, the light's a little bit more difficult. You know, it gets, gets easier with practice, but that's just because you have, you know, I've painted that before, so I can paint it again kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, sometimes I look at actors if I have a particular look. I used to rely very, very heavily on all my friends. I stopped doing that so much just because I don't always have access to them. It's tough to you know, ask them to drop everything and come over and pose for me. And also, I just felt too indebted to them. Um, whoops. <laughs> I don't know, it's just, it was too much of a logistical problem. Like, if I didn't get quite the right image from them that I wanted, uh, I didn't really feel like I could ask them to come over again and uh, waste their time with me. So that's one reason I switched to the, the sculptures. But my roommate Kikuo is still always there in case I need a particular difficult pose or something like that. Do you return the favor? Yeah. <laughs> Our, uh, I, I don't know, some people have mentioned that we often tend to illustrate characters that look like the other. Uh, he has a few characters that look like me and I have a few that look like him. I was the model for Thrust Man, for instance, and he was my model for Professor X, since he happens to look somewhat like a young Yul Brynner. Uh, but I, I don't rely on that nearly as heavily as I used to. The other main thing that I do is I, I don't have it out right now, but I have a big mirror, and I'm always checking myself out. <laughs> figure out, like, I mean, in this particular page, I'm, you know, I'm, I might as well, might as well show, I don't know if this will, rep, you know, show on the screen, but if I've got a tough angle, you know, I'm the girl in this particular pose, can you see that, or? Yeah. All right. So, you know, that corresponds to this, you know, obviously I look nothing like her, but I'm looking more for the gesture and the general facial expression. Uh, you know, and in this case, it's the particular way that the hand falls when you're delicately holding the CD, uh, and then I'll use it for that. You know, it, uh, just little things like that, uh, because gesture is often about subtlety. And, you know, if you can come up with that hand on your own, that's great. Uh, if you draw it enough times, you will be able to eventually. But right now, I need to know how that looks, so I just took a picture of myself. And, uh, I don't know, I do that all the time for all kinds of things. Uh, most often with hands, I'd say. You know, like this one corresponds to that. You know, I don't look anything like him, the lighting's all completely different, but I just, I wanted to act out the scene to get the exact facial expression that he has when he says his particular line, like, uh, oh yeah, what's his face, he's getting bent out of shape, but I don't really care. Yeah. Obviously Paul Jenkins wrote something better than that, and that's why he does his job and I do mine, but uh, that's essentially the gist of what he says. 
and that's what I try and go for. You said you paint around, you work around 12 hours a day? Yeah, I uh, generally work until about 4 in the morning and then go to bed, wake up about 10.30, go to the gym, come back, eat lunch, shower, and start working. So I, I sometimes don't get to work until like 12.30 or 1, sometimes later. Uh, but then, you know, my work day continues until 4 a.m., so it's not much of an issue. I like working late at night because there's less distraction. And you don't feel like you're missing as much, I guess. Because I, I have tried to, like, get up early and uh, attack the day, get up at 7.30 and 8. And it's just like I get up and I'm like, everyone else is outside. And I want to go outside. It's like it was like dead quiet outside, nothing's going on. But women in general are often difficult to draw just because any like wrong move can make them look bad. And this is specifically uh, addressing women in most superhero comics, since most of them uh, tend to look like supermodels. Well, couldn't you say the same for the men? You could, but in general, when you're drawing men, the more lines you put on, the grittier they look, which is often what you're going for. And with the women, you know, the more times you touch the paper, you know, the worse they're going to look. And that's fine if it's, some, you know, someone old or, you know, if you want to show, like, wear and tear on their face, that's cool. But... Just, I mean, that's what I've found in general. I've heard that from a lot of other artists. It is, it is difficult. You know, all the guys look like bodybuilders, but it's, it's just not the same because you can do, you do harsh lighting on them, and it, it seems to always look pretty good. And the women, you just have to be very, very careful because it's easy just to go a little bit too far. And then your editor will call you up as uh, I got a call once and said uh, the invisible woman looks like an old hag <laughs> and uh, I was hurt but I, I took his advice and just kind of softened her face up a bit and everybody was happy except for my girlfriend at the time who posed for it but <clears throat> Now, how hard is it for when an editor calls to make a correction? Uh, most of the things that I would have issues with, I try, or that they, rather, they would have issues with, I try and get done at this stage. So when I send them this, that's a pretty good idea of what the finished product is going to look like. So in this case, I sent them that, plus the layout, just the pencil sketch. And they got back to me and says, looks good. Uh, watch the contrast in the first few panels which, you know, as I said before, I get a lot just because it's a dark scene. Um, but I mean, we, we have a pretty good system going on, you know, at this point. I'm, you know, this is my fourth year of working for Marvel. And they know generally the difference between this, what I send them for approval, and what the final is going to be. So I remember at the beginning they would, you know, they didn't really know me, so I'd send in this quick sketch of, like, the angel, and they'd be like, he looks weird man like his you know his torso is all you know, and you know my sketch is like this tiny and I'm like you know it's it's gonna look good in the end but they don't know that because they don't really have a working relationship with you yet but at this point I you know I, I try and make a pretty finished product that they can judge uh, the only I don't think I've had to change a finished piece since a saber tooth cover and in that case I was working with a different editor and just we weren't we weren't used to working with each other yet, and then it, once I did that one, the other three Sabretooth covers were fun. Um, and before that, it was a Spider-Man cover, uh, but that was because uh, Sony apparently owns 3D webbing, and I guess that's what I had painted, and so I had to actually go in 
I liked the way the, the oil painting looked. Yeah, I don't know if you want to... I'll, I'll get it out of there. What do you mean they own 3D weather? <laughs> exactly what I said. They, um... For the movie, they wanted their Spider-Man to be distinct from Marvel Comics Spider-Man. So, uh... Is that enough light? Uh, I had painted it so that his webbing was simply reflective. You know, because I wanted the glint of the early morning sun in this photo, or, you know, whatever. And, uh... He, you know, I got an email and just said, we can't do that. Yeah, that's uh, in this case, I kept the painting the same. And I just went into Photoshop and I just manually went through and darkened every single one so it looked just black on red. And there, you know... That so 3D sounds... webbing on a costume. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. You know, I don't, I don't like to get involved with illegal stuff, so... That's, that's their job. <clears throat> You're doing Ghost Rider right now, and the movie is going to come out next year. Have you had any issues regarding that? No. <laughs> There's not a whole lot to do. Um, that's the funniest thing about this this whole project mythos. It's supposed to be somewhat of a tie-in to the movie and bridge the gap between the comics and the movie. But, you know, I don't... This has nothing to do with Nicolas Cage <laughs> at all. Uh, and also, like, just the design of uh, their character. I mean, the character in the movie is Johnny Blaze, but he looks more like the later incarnation of Ghost Rider with all the chains you know, the badass look, whatever. And ours is definitely going back to the original one, which was in the 70s. And everybody is, you know, it's got the long hair and wears scarves and <laughs> lets their chest hair show. Um, I don't know, this doesn't have a whole lot to do with the movie, but they are planning to release it at the same time. Uh, simply, you know, I imagine just for sales. And we're going to do the same thing with Spider-Man. Uh, where our Mythos Spider-Man will come out at the same time as the third movie. <clears throat> now, did your deadline change because um, the Ghost Rider movie got pushed back? Yeah, actually, it did change a little bit. I was working on Hulk at the time, and up to that point, I th they were telling me that I was going to have to stop Hulk midway and start working on Ghost Rider so that it could be out in time for the movie. And then when they... Uh, pushed it back, it was like almost a year. It was really good for me because then I got to finish Hulk all the way through and then uh, do Ghost Rider after that. Uh, but right now I'm, I, am, I am on a pretty tight schedule because, uh, not necessarily for Ghost Rider, I, I'm pretty sure I'll, well, I'm definitely sure I'll get that out in time for the movie, but they want Spider-Man after that and that's going to be very, very, very tight. And so, as a result, Ghost Rider is. And each one of these books takes me about four months to do, and so I have to be done with the Spider-Man book a month before the release of the movie, so the book's out in time. And in this case, I kind of lost some of that detail on his hand, so I'll just kind of look at my own. He's holding a CD. I just want to get the general gesture. The drawing was there originally, but I've kind of erased it and smudged it with my hand. So it's not quite as distinct now. Once I have that, go over with another wash. That's good to go. One of the main reasons that this is much faster than the oil painting is because you get to use the white of the paper as an aspect of value. So you can get a light value of, say, ash rose without having to mix white in it. And it sounds like it takes that much time, but it really starts to add up when you have to start mixing other colors in there. And basically, using the white of the paper takes away one of the variables of color, which is brightness. 
and darkness, or otherwise known as value. Already having, you know, I was okay with a pencil, so I figured, oh, a brush can't be that much more difficult. You know, it was. <laughs> I don't know. I would definitely start out with drawing and then move up. But at the same time, I mean, it's it's pretty fun to just go in there and just mess around if you do have the paints already. Uh, it's one of the things I, you know, I grew up in the art store and I, I had access to all the paints and I, I just didn't really use them that much. Uh, I kind of wish I did, but you know, I got to it eventually, so it wasn't too bad. I bought a lot of paint <laughs> in the last six years. Uh, still have a lot of it sitting around. And uh, I remember one teacher told me, it's like, if you're not, if you're not wasting paint, you're not learning how to paint. And it's true. When I first started, I. I bought some paint and I would just, I would just like squeeze just the tiniest pea drop on my palette and just try and make that last. And I'm just not going to learn anything without messing up. And uh, you need a lot of paint to, to mess up. When I'm doing a composition, I, I, I like to think about what the dominant stroke is going to be. Essentially, what, what's the last thing, or the last time you touch your artwork, what, where is that going to occur, and what is it going to be? Is it going to be a feature, is it going to be a shadow, uh, maybe a source of light? And in this case, for the end, I've saved the, the light streaming in from the, the open door hits her, uh, her jumpsuit, I want it to kind of pop. And so I'll leave that to the end and just kind of, it's not even bright enough. Bring it a little bit more white. Especially true in, in dark compositions that, you know, if you really want something to pop, make uh, some kind of opaque bright color at the very very end and have that be the last thing you do to it and it'll be kind of like a highlight color and that's what makes uh you know, gives you a sense of the, the light in a particular place so basically i mean we're just just barely getting the edge of the clothing a whole lot there, but it defines your silhouette a little bit and allows you to see some of the gesture on your torso and hips. Yeah, so in this case, uh, you know, I've still got to work on her eyes a little bit. I want to get a little bit better reference for the hands. You know, I've got the general gesture there, and that's what's you know the main important feature. But with paint, it's like it doesn't really look finished until you start adding a little bit of form, detail, and uh, and lighting to it. And it'll be finished. We'll move on to page eleven.